Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bethel this evening. Good to see you here uh, tonight. And if you're watching at home, if you have your Bible with you tonight, could you turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 8? Acts <coughs> chapter 8. If you were here last week, you'll have remembered that um, we got to the point where Stephen had become the first Christian um, martyr, and um, there was a man there called Saul, uh, and they laid their coats at Saul's feet, and the first part of verse 1 of chapter 8 uh, tells us that Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about <coughs> preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in that city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greater, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptised, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but, he had only been but, only, but they had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right with, before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. 
Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generations? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with, with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he, as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So reads the word. Of God. Well, good evening. Thanks for having me and um, to open up God's word to us uh, this evening. Before we do, let us pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word says. Heavenly Father, your word says to us so clearly that we are sinners in desperate need of a saviour. We thank you that we have your word, which is truth. We thank you that your word changes lives and it is still changing lives today. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak through your word this evening to all of our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Come and move amongst us, we pray. Teach us, change us, rebuke us, conform us more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Last week, I spent uh, a few cold and very windy days in Gdansk in Poland. And I went with my two sons. One of them was playing football, and the other one came along for the ride, or probably came along for the sky from school. It's a, it's a beautiful city on the Baltic Sea, and somewhere I, I knew nothing about um, before, before visiting, before we went. It's remarkable for its culture, for its architecture, for its heritage, for its history. And in fact, it's the place where the opening shots of World War II were fired by the German soldiers attacking the port of Westerplatz at the Polish unit who were stationed there. It's a city which took an extreme pounding and shelling and many areas of the city of Gdansk were completely destroyed. And yet, amazingly, out of the trauma of that terrifying period, a new and vibrant and growing city has emerged. Out of opposition and persecution has come expansion and growth and new life. As we continue in this series tonight in the, the book of Acts, it's a story of the Acts of the Apostles, but it's actually a, a story of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's a story about the growth of the church and the spread of the gospel. It's a story about the conversions of men and women and young people coming to saving faith in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. But as you'll know and have 
heard no doubt many times before, where the people of God say we will arise and build, the enemy of God say we will arise and oppose. And therefore, as the apostles begin the early chapters of Acts by preaching and testifying of all that they have seen and heard and experienced, and as they share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and the need for men and women to repent and believe, at the very same time, opposition is increasing. Threats have followed and persecution of the church has spread. But it still cannot stop thousands of men and women and young people being converted. And so as conversions increase, so too does the opposition. Now I believe last week you finished the section with this story of this godly man Stephen who was stoned to death for his faith. But isn't it remarkable that in the the mystery of his providence, who was it who was pulling the strings in the background? It's this Pharisee of Pharisees, this Hebrew of Hebrews, the righteous, zealous, legally blameless young man called Saul of Tarsus. And while it can almost look as if the gospel is at stake because of the intensity of Saul's opposition and threats towards the church there in verse 1 and verse 3. God is in all of it. Isn't it true? They intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. And in some ways, this opposition is used as the trigger point for the fulfillment of the promise recorded in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, we will see in a few moments in in verse 4, and then to the uttermost ends of the earth, and even here tonight in verse 26, to Ethiopia and Africa. Would this gospel growth have come without such opposition, forcing people to leave their homes and their livelihoods and their neighborhoods in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, moving out beyond their comfort zones, telling all those that they came into contact with about why they were leaving, about whom they loved, about why they trusted him, and why he was so precious to them. And so we see persecution and opposition, but we also see preaching and growth. And in the midst of it all, we also see that the gospel does what it's always done, The gospel separates the world. With those who truly believe and those who don't, the genuine believer and those whose lives are never truly changed, the one who is devoted to Jesus and the one who is only truly devoted to himself. And so we'll pick up on on some of that uh, as we go through chapter 8. We're going to divide our time into four. Number one, as persecution grows, the gospel scatters. Number two, As preaching increased, joy followed. Number three, as conversions continue, the counterfeit join. And number four, as the word is explained, lives are changed. So number one, as persecution grows, the gospel scatters, verse one. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So as we've already said, the immediate context of the passage is that Stephen has just been stoned and killed. Why? Well, because of the way that he had preached with such directness and clarity and boldness about Jesus and his death and who was responsible. And obviously, the truth hurts. And people didn't like the truth, did they? And so they tried to silence the preacher and try to frighten and intimidate the believers in in Jerusalem into some sort of submission. But in actual fact, what they actually did was the complete opposite. Now, I'm sure some of you will have heard 
of the early church father, Tertullian, from the second century. He wrote something called his Apologeticus in connection with other Christian persecution carried out by the Romans, and he said this, We are not a new philosophy, but a divine revelation. That's why you can't just exterminate us. The more you kill, the more we are. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's a familiar quote, which may not be written about Acts chapter 8, but it so easily could have been. Because what we see is that as Stephen is killed, and as this great persecution breaks out in Jerusalem, and as Saul ravaged the church, and as believers are thrown into prison and dragged off from house to house, and as their blood is shed, what happens is not what the religious leaders had in mind, is it? Because in their foolishness, they really thought that they could thwart the plans of Almighty God. They really must have thought that they could stop his promise of Acts 1.8 and could halt the irresistible work of the Holy Spirit in drawing people to salvation and loving Jesus. And so therefore, their intention was to strike a hammer blow to the spread of the gospel, stopping it at source. But seeds are sown. First of all in Jerusalem, but then also throughout Judea and Samaria. And as men and women flee for their lives and, and go off in search of safety and, and, and a new place to, to set up their lives and set up home, they don't just go with their goods, but they go with the gospel in their hearts and in their minds and they cannot but speak of the things that they have seen and heard and experienced. And although their, their faith had clearly been tested, it doesn't appear as though it had wavered because their response wasn't one of defeat, was it? They preached the word. Just trying to use a bit of imagination. Here's a man. He's settling into his new neighborhood in Samaria. He's far from home. Perhaps he's looking after a few of his livestock out there in the fields, and he gets into conversation with one of the locals. <laughs> You're not from round here, are you, mate? <laughs> Where's your accent from? Have you just arrived? What are you doing here? Well, we've had to flee Jerusalem, you see. I'm a follower of Jesus, the Messiah, the one who was killed and buried, who rose again on the third day. Because of my devotion to him, our, our lives are in danger. I, I believe in who he is. I believe in what he's done. I'm in fear for my life, but I love him. I can't deny him. Can I tell you about him? I'd love to introduce you to him. Or well, here's a lady. She's collecting water at the well in Samaria, and other ladies notice and say, you're not from around here. Are you new? What are you doing around here? And she shares the same story about the persecution in Jerusalem about her love for the Lord Jesus and how she knows that her salvation is secure in Christ. Or here's a young child and they're out playing in the streets or out in the field and they're getting involved with, with the other kids in the city. And the message is the same. We've moved here because we love Jesus. Would you like, to tell, would you like me to tell you why I love him? Well, for me he bled and died. The Lord of all creation became the crucified Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It says those who were scattered went about preaching the word. If you were to flick forward to Acts chapter 11, verse 19, you'd read that those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to none except Jews, but some also spoke to the Greeks in Antioch, preaching the Lord Jesus. And so not only did these events cause the spread of the church to Judea and Samaria, but also to the Gentile-speaking world as well. It's amazing. Now, 
Does verse 4 mean that they all became public ministers and preachers of the gospel? No. But it does mean that they communicated and shared the gospel and shared their love for the Lord Jesus Christ in the ordinariness and day-to-day activities of life. They shared their faith through ordinary conversations, wherever they may have been found, every day, speaking of Jesus. They shared their faith naturally. They shared their faith simply. They shared their faith effectively. And despite everything, the gospel cannot be chained. The word of the Lord endures, and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ spreads. And that's an important reminder to us all this evening, I think. We're not in the same situation as Stephen in chapter 7, or here in Acts chapter 8. We're not yet in danger of being dragged off from our homes, from our businesses, from our schools, by, an, a, by a, a, a ravaging... Saul, but opposition to the gospel in our schools is definitely on the rise. Opposition to Christians speaking of Christ in the workplaces is increasingly difficult. We know what the the media and political landscape is like. Life is definitely becoming more and more difficult for Christians, especially in the public sphere. And therefore, although our modern day culture may want to limit Uh, uh, limit the spread of the gospel the pressing need for churches and for Christians today is to stand firm on the promise of his word and continue to trust and continue to speak and continue to share our faith in exactly the same way as these people do here in Samaria wherever God has placed you whoever you are do whatever you can to share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we see as preaching increased, joy followed. Verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame, were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Hopefully you'll remember that Philip was one of the seven deacons chosen in Acts chapter 6. A man of good repute, wise, filled with the Spirit. And importantly, he was a man whose character was recognized by the church. But we also know that he was gifted And his gifting was used widely in the early church. We find out later on in in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, that he was known as Philip the Evangelist. Now, we don't know if this was an official role or if it was just general recognition of the ministry that he performed and was involved with. But he was known as Philip the Evangelist. Again, in Acts 21, we also find out that he owns his own house. He lives in Caesarea. He hosts the Apostle Paul on a a visit. He had four unmarried daughters. Imagine the cost of that wedding. (laughs) Don't envy him. But he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. He must have been a godly dad. But here he is in Acts 8, verse 5. He's fleeing persecution like everyone else did. Apart from the apostles, the apostles stay in Jerusalem. And he arrives in Samaria and he witnesses and testifies and proclaims the news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. And what was the response from the people there? Well, the people listened to what he said and the conviction with which he said it. And people no doubt were gripped because of his eyewitness accounts of the things that he had seen. The things that had taken place in Jerusalem and the impact that the gospel had had on people's lives. And so they paid close attention to Philip the Evangelist and to the accompanying signs and wonders and miracles of healing that he performed. Now it's interesting that Philip goes to Samaria 
because as you'll know, the relationship between Samaritans and those from a Jewish background, it wasn't always the most cordial. They weren't the best of mates. Animosity had existed between these groups of people for, for centuries, since the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, and since the separation of, of the kingdom into the northern and southern kingdoms. This animosity has existed all those years. So the fact that Philip is bringing a message of peace and forgiveness and eternal security in Christ alone to the people of Samaria, and it being received gladly, this is incredible. Because it's not just the crowds listening and paying attention and weighing up what's being said in an intellectual way, is it? Look at the response in verse 8. There's joy. In fact, there's much joy, it says. And this joy in the Lord and joy because of the Lord was everywhere across the city, in the schools, in the workplaces, in the markets, in the fields, in the streets, everywhere. Joy in the city because of Christ. Wouldn't it be incredible if churches and Christians in Old Swan and Shoebrook and Allerton and Garston and Speak, Norris Green, Fazakley, were filled with a fraction of the joy that is found here in Acts 8, verse 8. Joy followed the preaching of God's word. Thirdly, as conversions continue, the counterfeit joined from, from 9 through to 25. So here we are in Samaria, and it's clear that there's a, a real buzz throughout the city because of the impact of Philip's ministry. People have been healed. Others can now walk. Lives have been changed. Communities have been completely transformed. But then we sort of get this contrasting situation and excitement in the city, which had previously uh, revolved around a man called Simon. So who is this man Simon? Well... We're told he's, he's a magician. He's a sorcerer, perhaps, in some versions. Perhaps, possibly he's a clever magician. He's certainly a larger-than-life character. Perhaps we could consider him as the David Blaine or um, Darren Brown or Dynamo of his day. Previously, the biggest excitement in Samaria had been to do with all his amazing tricks and acts and all his magic. And it led to a cult following Everyone knew him. His fame spread throughout the city. And that meant that his ego grew. And he called himself somebody great, we're told in verse 9. While the people called him the power of God called great, verse 10. He was probably successful, really good at what he did. He probably made a living from his magic, which seems to have been suddenly impacted by the arrival of Philip and the preaching of the gospel. No longer was Philip the greatest show in town because here was Philip performing miracles and signs and wonders with the blessing of heaven. And verse 12, it appears that when men and women in the city heard the truth of the gospel, they were convicted about their need for Christ and they believed and they were converted. And then as a public display of their faith and of their trust in Jesus, they were subsequently baptized. But then we have this problem in verse 13. Because we're told that Simon also believes and is baptized. So why is this a problem? Well, the issue which now plays out from verse 13 to 25 is that not everyone who says, Lord... Lord will be saved. And not everyone who says they believe will be saved. And not everyone who is baptized will be truly converted. And that includes Simon. So how do we know? Well, first of all, a visit is arranged for the apostles, Peter and John, and they come and see what was happening with the outpouring of faith in Samaria in verse 15. They prayed they prayed that the people would receive the Holy Spirit and then they come and lay hands. 
Now, this is where we truly see the state of Simon's heart because when he sees what Peter and John do with their apostolic authority, how does he react? Wow, this is incredible. I want to be able to do that, verse 19. Give me this power also. I'll pay you for it. I want it. I need it. I'll I'll give you some money so I can do that. Just imagine what I'll be able to do if I can can do the things that you can do. The, The money that I could earn. I don't want Christ. I don't want his spirit. But I want this power. I want this influence. And Peter sees right through Simon's heart. He rebukes him strongly in verse 20. May your silver perish with you. You have no part in this. I know you said you believe. I know you've even been baptized. But verse 21, your heart isn't right before God. Repent and ask for forgiveness, verse 22. For you are in the bond of iniquity. Simon, you're a fraud. You're a phony. Get on your knees and seek the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he is near. Perhaps we could liken Simon to the stony ground in the parable of the sower. At first receives the word. But it has no root. So it withers and dies. Perhaps it was merely head knowledge, no heart change. Maybe he was caught up in the emotion of seeing what was going on and everyone else coming to faith in the Lord Jesus and being baptized and he just gets caught up in the events that are going on around him. But he was unprepared to say, all to Jesus I surrender, all to thee I freely give. He could never say, I will ever love and trust you in your presence daily live he just couldn't do it and so here's the final proof of the state of Simon's heart verse 20 uh, 24 is he humbled is he under conviction of sin does he throw himself on the mercy of God no because he can't even bring himself to pray for himself he says to the apostles pray for me no Simon pray for yourself I don't know if there's any young people here this evening watching online. Perhaps you've never been told. Let me remind you. You can't be saved because your parents pray for you or your church leaders pray for you. You can't be saved because of their faith. It's about you. It's about your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to come to him in repentance and faith. Their prayers, as good as they may be, they cannot save you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. You get on your knees. You pray. Unlike Simon, who wouldn't do it. Now I guess someone might ask, but what about the rest of the people in Samaria? What about their faith? Were they genuine? Were they truly converted? Why did they need Peter and John to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit? Does that mean that they didn't have the Holy Spirit to begin with? And that must mean that they weren't converted in the first place. Was their conversion in, in, in two stages? Was there some sort of second blessing? Does that mean that we need someone to come and lay hands on us so that we receive the Spirit today? These are good questions. <laughs> Difficult questions. And there are Christians and theologians who will have differing views on some of these points. I'd encourage you to go away and think it through. We won't have time to cover it all this evening. Might sound like a bit of a cop-out, but I'm a visitor, so you can go easy on me. But let's just say a a few things uh, uh, about this. Firstly, was the faith of the Samaritans genuine? Well, look at verse 6. They paid close attention to what Philip preached about Christ. Verse 8. What they saw, what they heard, it filled them with joy. Verse 12. They believed Philip. 
as he preached about the name of Jesus and the kingdom of God. They believed. Verse 12, they responded to what they had heard in baptism. And verse 16, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 14, the apostles were told that the Samaritans had received the word. So to me, all of this points to the fact that these men and women were definitely converted. They were genuine believers when Peter and John arrived to pray for them. They were already converted, genuine believers. So secondly, what does the New Testament say about faith? Well, if you remember back to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he's already talked about this and said, in response to conviction of sin, from hearing the truth of God's word, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. He said that already. And who brings about conviction of sin? Who opens hearts, who opens eyes to the truth of the gospel? Who draws people to the Father? Yes, it's the irresistible work of the Holy Spirit. And so I think we can say that the Holy Spirit was at work in the heart of these Samaritan people, bringing them to genuine saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before Peter and John had arrived. So then thirdly, were these events normal? Or was this perhaps some sort of one-off unique event? Well, as we've already said, this was definitely a breakthrough moment in the growth of the early church and a pivotal time for the spread of the gospel, which had so far been confined to the areas in and around Jerusalem. And now, as a result of persecution and the preaching of Philip, this gospel witness had stretched beyond those borders and boundaries and had arrived now in Samaria with the long-time enemies of the Jewish people. And therefore, some would say that this was a one-off, unique experience, which warranted the prayerful attention of the apostles, Peter and John themselves, coming to see that the old covenant divisions had now been removed, and authenticating the fact that these Samaritans are now united with the Lord Jesus Christ. They were there in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came visibly and brought about visible effects to authenticate the work of the gospel and God's promise of Acts 1.8. And now they are here again as witnesses in Samaria to see a similar visible outpouring of the Holy Spirit as his word is fulfilled. So as we see throughout the birth of the early church, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given through the apostles and brought about visible signs and miracles and wonders and healings and prophecies and tongues and so on. Perhaps this was also the case here in Samaria in Acts 8 at this particular point in time. So the Holy Spirit was at work to bring them to saving faith. And the Holy Spirit was then at work in a special, visible way to show this pivotal moment in the spread of the gospel. And then fourthly, as we close, as the word is explained, lives are changed. In complete contrast with Simon, the magician, this big head, this somebody, this Mr. Big, this phony, this fraud who thought he could buy his way into the kingdom of heaven and buy access to the Holy Spirit. From verse 26 through to 40, we meet a mother, a, another man and he couldn't be any more different. Verse 27, he doesn't have a name. He's just called the Ethiopian. He's called a, a, a eunuch. And therefore his status in society would have been nothing like Simon's. He would have been looked down upon. Not just because he was a Gentile, but because he was a eunuch. We also see that he's a servant in the courts of the queen. So therefore, he must have been trusted. He must have been trusted so much that he's placed in charge of the treasury. But more than all of that, surely we see that there's something stirring in his heart. <laughs> there must have been questions in his mind. Something was causing him to seek the Lord. And search for meaning and truth. And it had taken him all away to Jerusalem to worship. And then verse 28. 
as he begins his long journey returning from Jerusalem to the court of Candace by chariot back in Ethiopia, we find him with a copy of the scriptures and he's reading. So was it a conversation in Jerusalem that made him turn to Isaiah 53? Was it something that he'd heard spoken out there in Jerusalem? Was he being like the Bereans we, we read about in Acts and he was examining the scriptures to see the things that he had heard, to examine them, to see if these things were so? Was it the only piece of the scripture that he had and he was reading it over and over again and committing it to memory? Was it just potluck? <laughs> and he pulled out his finger and as he's opening the scroll, it just lands on Isaiah 53. Whatever it was, Philip sees and then he hears him, doesn't he? And he's prompted by the Spirit in verse 29. And then he runs up to him in verse 30. And he says, do you understand? Do you understand what you're reading? Isn't it interesting? All Simon wanted is to be able to perform signs and wonders. Whereas this man, all this man wants is to be able to understand and meet and now the one about whom the prophet is speaking in Isaiah 53. Who is this one who is despised and rejected? Who is the man of sorrows acquainted with grief? Why did he carry our griefs, he wondered? Why was he smitten and afflicted by God? Why was he wounded for our transgressions? If he was wounded for our transgressions, does that mean he was wounded for my transgressions? Was he crushed for my iniquities? Does this mean that even me, even a Gentile, even a eunuch can be healed by his stripes? I know I've gone astray. I know I've turned my own way. How can it be then an innocent lamb was killed for me? And so verse 35, Philip has the greatest privilege of his life. And he opens up the scriptures and he shares the good news of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world for all who would believe. The Son of God who died on the cross for sinners such as me, who was buried, who rose again the third day and who lives for more in the power of an endless life. He's the one who is coming again as King and as Lord and as Judge of all. And we must believe and we must repent and we must trust in Christ. And in Christ alone. And if we re repent and believe, Philip says, we should be baptized to signify our union with Jesus in his death and burial. And that we are being raised to newness of life, to a living hope that one day we will reign with him in heaven with an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away reserved in heaven for someone like this Ethiopian eunuch. What a ministry. What an opportunity Philip had to share his faith. And so what's the impact on this Ethiopian man? Conviction of sin. Genuine faith. Obedience to God's word. Here is water. Why can't I be baptized as well? And then verse 39... He went on his way rejoicing because he had met with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. A chapter which started with persecution, ends with joy and the gospel being taken back to Ethiopia. So what else do we see in Acts 8? Well, God's spirit is at work. God's son is proclaimed. God's word is changing lives. God's promises are being fulfilled. God's people are being strengthened in their faith and God's kingdom has grown. Isn't that what we want as a church today? God's spirit to be at work in our hearts, in our lives. God's son to be glorified in our midst. God's word to be preached with power so that men, women, and young people are confronted with the truth of the gospel. Hear the truth, see the truth, believe the truth. 
God's promises being trusted and believed, giving us assurance in our faith. God's people at Bethel Green Lane and at Bridge Chapel being encouraged, souls being added to the kingdom of God. May that be the case even so this evening. Persecution, preaching, pretense, and praise. Let us stand and sing as we close our service this evening.